Hello, I'm Paul Pirello and welcome to the Philly Factor. Not too far from where we are sitting right here on the campus of LaSalle University is one of America's most well-preserved historic sites. Cliveden remains one of the nation's best documented and least altered colonial homes and is located in one of America's most historic neighborhoods. Well known as the scene of a Revolutionary War battle, Cliveden's story spans four centuries of American history. The men, women, and children connected to this historic site provoke multiple uh, wants to examine what uh, could only, what it could mean to be American. So uh, Brandy Levine is the development director for Cliveden. She shares with us this chapter of our American history. And Brandy, I want to welcome you to our program. Well, thank you, Paul. Perhaps the, um, the most pressing question I have for you is, is it Cliveden? Cliveden, Cleveden. What is the correct pronunciation of this home? And the choice is yours. The choice is mine. Uh, yes, you, uh, there are people who say Cliveden on Cliveden Street, okay. and Cliveden on Cliveden Street, and Cliveden on Cliveden Street, and usually it's only people from Britain that say Cleveden. Okay. But it is, there's, there's no specific pronunciation. Okay. It, it's so where did the name come from then? Because this was, for the longest time, um, where the Chu family, a prominent Philadelphia family, mm -hmm. uh, resided in Germantown. So where did the name come from? I don't know specifically. There is a Cliveden in England. Okay. And it is a very large stately manor that has since become a wedding venue and hotel, okay. <laughs> um, like many stately homes. And uh, it is roughly contemporaneous, but I don't know the exact reason why Benjamin Chu, who built, who had Cliveden built for him, chose the name of Cliveden. When, and I, I told you the story before that uh, when I was an underclassman here at LaSalle many, many, many years ago and taking an American history course, mm -hmm. um, we took the typical tour, you know, to Independence Hall and the Betsy Ross house and the, Edgar Allan Poe house and we also went to Cliveden and for me it was an eye-opening experience because it was probably one of the first times that I could recall that I heard of the Battle of Germantown mm -hmm. which was a, um, a, a major skirmish between Washington's troops, our colonial mm -hmm. yes. uh, men in uh, our army and the British forces. Yeah. And so every year I know the Battle of Germantown is reenacted there on the property but, mm -hmm. um, you know, but Cliveden is so much more than the Battle of Germantown. It absolutely is. And the Battle of Germantown, of course, is a really important part of it. And the reenactment dates back a long time. But it, the house was originally built by Benjamin Chu between 1763 and 1767, or I should say built for Benjamin Chu, mm -hmm. because he most certainly did not do any of the building himself. Right and it was lived in with a short break after the Battle of Germantown where Benjamin Chu sold it um, to a man named Blair McClanahan for several years um, and then repurchased the house and moved back in. It was lived in by members of the Chu family until 1970. Wow. And so there's 200 years of family history there, but that also reflects and embodies the history of our nation in many ways. And right now we're in the process of completing a project uh, called Living Kitchens at Cliveden that was funded by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage um, that explores two kitchens on the property. One is a seven uh, uh, the kitchen dependency building, which is a separate building from the house uh, built in between 1763 and 1767, where uh, anybody who could afford to do so would build their kitchen separately because of the danger of fire. Mm -hmm. And then in 1959, Samuel Chu V, who was living there with his family, they installed a what uh, you know a prefabricated mid-century modern what they would have called the kitchen of the future I mean it looks like Joan Jetson cooked in it <laughs> you know I mean it, it, it was seafoam green and top-of-the-line cabinetry by Quaker made 
Q U A K E R M A I D. Right. Um, <laughs> and top of the line appliances for the time, a galley kitchen. And so we have 200 years of social history to be interpreted through just those two rooms, mm -hmm. one building, one room on the property. But then also after the fire, um, it, uh, well, there was a fire in the carriage house mm -hmm. in 1970. And that has a, a very interesting story we can get into later. But uh, it was after that that Samuel Chu decided that the property should really become an historic site. And uh, there a lot in the carriage house was damaged, but what was not damaged were the Chu family papers, which are 230,000 documents. Wow. Um, dating from the earliest days of the Chus right through the 20th century. And they were uh, given to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania because they care for documents. Right, right. And uh, in the early um, uh, 21st century, research into those documents revealed what a lot of people had sort of, what some people had forgotten and some people remembered that the Chus had owned slaves. Mm. And so this is uh, certainly a thread from the um, 18th century and into the 19th century. But then it also brings out a lot of other things about race, history, memory, servitude, elite classes, working classes, um, indentured servitude in the um, 1950s and 60s, uh, the Chus employed a, a gentleman named Abdul Rasid as a, their cook. I mean, they were of an echelon of society that could have a cook at that sure, time right. when many mm -hmm. people didn't. So there's, there's many aspects of American history, social history, political history uh, being interpreted at Cliveden today. Well, wow. and that is truly amazing because um, we are starting to learn and see, not only with the Chu family history, right. but when you go back and revisit those early years of American history, we see that the Chu family wasn't necessarily the only family that may have um, uh, had indentured servants mm -hmm. living with them and working for them. I mean, we saw with the whole excavation of the president's house mm -hmm. uh, in Old City that there were slave Mm -hmm. headquarters there, or slave quarters rather, mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, for when the original White House or the President's House right. was, was located there. So it's, it's mm -hmm. remarkable that this, this tale and the telling of this history is now starting to be told. And, uh, you know, when I, when I first started um, uh, remembering going to uh, Clifton, uh, you know, that was never part of the history that was told mm -hmm. to us because we really didn't know at that time that that, you know, actually mm -hmm. existed. And then, you know, some 230,000 documents that are turned over, someone starts to pour through it, and then mm -hmm. they learn that the, the Chu family had right. been involved. And that's why we say it really tells the tale of every man, woman, and child in American history, because, I mean, this is part of the fabric of our society mm -hmm. today, just like it was back in the 1700s. You're absolutely right. And one of the things that we love and work really hard to do at Cliveden is to create ways for people to see themselves in Cliveden's story. Mm -hmm. So for instance, for the, for throughout the Living Kitchens at Cliveden Project, we've had all different kinds of events and programs and what we call the kitchen conversations where people get together and um, you know, the, we have a speaker mm -hmm. and we've had some very notable ones. Um, Joe McGill, who is the director of the Slave Dwelling Project, and he speaks and does a presentation and then while, and people eat a meal prepared mm -hmm. by a local chef or a local restaurant or whatever, and then there's discussion. Um, we've had, uh, this was a really fun one, uh, it was a community exhibition called Mixing Memory, Sharing History. And it was people from the Germantown or Cliveden communities. And mm -hmm. some people can be related to or affiliated with or interested in Cliveden, even if they don't live in Germantown. Mm -hmm. So people um, uh, loaned objects that had some kind of personal meaning in their life, sure. something related to a kitchen or cooking or um, a memory of a kitchen or cooking or, or whatever. Um, 
to this exhibition and you know, we, it, we had the items on display and created a, a, an exhibition catalog with recipes and right. photographs and stuff. But the thing that is like what people were really, like the types of things people brought, a woman named Marianne Tyler c contributed to the um, uh, exhibition and she had cooking equipment from her family's restaurant. The t I, I believe it was Tyler Family Restaurant or the Tyler Family Tea House. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the restaurant. But it was in Germantown mm -hmm. in the early part of the 20th century. She's now an older woman. Um, and her parents ran the restaurant and she has cooking pots and things from this restaurant and had photographs of her her parents running the restaurant and and recipes and it's still one of the recipes that she gave was for um, hot cakes and the, her husband still loves them mm -hmm. so it's a recipe that that dates into her family's history but is something she's still using today that her husband loves and their family, this family restaurant, was just a couple of blocks from Cliveden. So right. we, we learned things just about the neighboring community that we didn't know, you, even though the history is not that far in the past. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's it's only you know 40 years ago, or we know that, and, and kitchens are a room in any house that change over time. Mm -hmm. So. The kitchen dependency built in 1767 with a big open hearth fireplace, mm -hmm. which was then filled in. And they installed what was called a kitchener range, a huge cast iron kitchen range in the middle of the 19th century. We're not necessarily quite sure when, but we're finding things out all the time. So we might have found that out mm -hmm. and I, I, don't, I don't know it yet. Um, so a huge cast iron range was installed and it just so happened that somebody who lives in the neighborhood in Mount Airy still has a Kitchener range in their home. They don't use it, but uh -huh. it's in their home. And not only did they have that, but it would have been similar to the one that had been installed in Clifton um, in the 19th century. Um, but not only did they have, have the big huge stove, but in those days, salesmen would travel around from house to house selling stoves with a tiny little model. Hmm. And so they have a model How about that? of the stove in their own home. And right. people think it's a toy. No, it wasn't a toy. It was a salesman's model. Yeah. So that, the model was in the exhibition and, and it was something that, you know, was related to what was in Clifton, maybe not specifically. So all the people who contributed to the exhibition in some way f felt invested in Clifton and saw part of their own story in Clifton and sharing their story. Or even if it's something that, that there's this beautiful, uh, well, in 1959, the uh, Chews living there then put in this, you know, Joan Jetson kitchen. Mm. Um, and so many people walk in and go, oh, this was just like the kitchen I grew up in, or my grandmother's kitchen was like this, right. or you know, the young people who are too young to have actually maybe seen a kitchen like that. I mean, mid-century modern is like all the rage now. So yeah. they come in and they're like, wow, this is really cool. I wish my kitchen was like this. Right, and, right. You know, and it's also was sort of the part of the beginning of the era of, of kitchens as we know them today, mm -hmm. you know, it no longer had fireplaces and you know, had all the, had stand mixers and things like that. So. Well, what's amazing now is that when you say that the Chu family put this, what was then modern kitchen in, in the late 1950s, um, I would suspect that um, it was a bold move on their part, but since, since they were still living there, it was still their home, mm -hmm. they were still able to do this because it was their home, but if that building as it has become part of the National Historic Trust now, you got to be very careful when you start to alter the design of these historic homes. So it's amazing that Chu, maybe he you know, um, realized that if he didn't do it now, it may never get done. Well, it, it's, it's, not that, it's not even that simple or direct, <laughs> okay? So there's the kitchen dependency, which originally was disconnected from the house. Right. Big open hearth. 
and then at some point they put in the Kitchener Range, which at some point was removed. Mm -hmm. And that building, which research also indicates had been used as living quarters for enslaved servants, but then at some point it also just became the caretaker's residence. Mm -hmm. You know, during the 20th century, um, the cook and groundskeeper lived in that building. Mm -hmm. um, but later in the um, 18th century, they built a colonnade connecting the kitchen dependency to the main house okay. so that the food could be run from the kitchen dependency building basically right into the dining room mm -hmm. um, because the door to the dining, there was a back door to the dining room. They could bring the food right in. So this way you didn't have to run through in the rain or snow, sure, right. but it was still open on both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, then in the mid, uh, then later that became enclosed. And in the mid 19th century as well, a, a big addition was put onto the back of, of Cliveden. And that kind of formed, a, it enclosed this space. And so the 1959 kitchen actually went into this enclosed colonnade mm -hmm. that connected the kitchen dependency building with the main house. About that, yeah. So the, he, he, and, and it was used for storage and as a pantry and, you know, had different uses over the years that we're just beginning to, you know, find out what was in some of those places. And it didn't even occupy the whole colonnade area yeah. either. So, so, it, but while it was his house, it was his house too. Yeah. I mean, he was able to, I mean, they had to put in bathrooms and showers sure, yeah, right. and, yeah. you know, all kinds of things to make it livable for a 20th aware, century family. But he was aware of the history oh, absolutely. of this property, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it had been in his family. The, you, there's bullet holes in the walls, the exterior walls. There's bullet holes in the interior walls. There's a what's called the blood portrait. Mm. And the, uh, the legend is that a dying young British soldier etched the face of his beloved on the wall of one of the bedrooms in his own blood. Mm. We can't prove this. We have had the material the, that was used for the painting right. tested. It is organic material. We can't identify it further than wow. that. We can't say that it is definitively blood and definitively dates from this period, but I, I'm, I, I, it seems plausible. It sure does. Yeah. yeah so. so how do you maintain then the, the integrity of that sketch or the bullet holes that are in the wall there? Because as we said, this is a not only you know part of Philadelphia history, but it's part of national mm -hmm. history. So how do you maintain the integrity of these of these items? Well, for something, it's it's difficult, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of work and a lot of funding. And so something like the blood portrait, it is on a wall. It is that had been painted over the years, but they not there. Mm -hmm. um, and it is protected under a sheet of plastic mm -hmm. that is covered with a piece of cloth so sunlight can't get in, sure. get to it and mm -hmm. make it fade even further. And so that's one way. Um, you have to be very judicious about painting. You have to be very judicious about repairing. Mm -hmm. You have to be very careful um, about cleaning sure. at all. Like for instance, the floors on the, in, in Cliveden are untreated wood. Mm -hmm. So we can't use modern cleaning products. Chemicals and, yeah, right. and, um, and then there's things too, like over the years, uh, different owners of Cliveden had upgraded and modernized it and and it becomes a question of well, what do you keep what do you try to reveal so there is a a section on the stairway where layers of paint have been scraped away to ref to reveal um, faux graining mm -hmm. on the woodwork mm -hmm. but it's it's you know it's faux it, it's sort of trompe loyal to you know look like it is right. a special wood grain, but it wasn't, but it was the fashion mm -hmm. whenever it was done. And um, at some point uh, in one of what are called the pocket rooms on either side of the main hall, 
uh, large bookcases were put in one of the rooms, and then later, uh, in the 20th century, a wet bar mm. was put into one, but then it was closed up again. Mm. And while a family is living in a house and it's a dynamic place and it's not, you know, open to the public, they can really do whatever they want to right. it. But a family like the Chews protected the bullet holes. They protected the bullet holes and the, like they didn't have the whole surface of, of Cliveden re stuccoed. Mm -hmm. You know, they kept the stucco and and uh, and if if it and some of it will need repair but we will have to, because just because of age and time and it's making the envelope of the house not as watertight mm -hmm. as it could be. So, um, which then causes issues in the interior Absolutely. and right. you know, right. all of that kind of thing. Um, but we have to work with a mason who, who can literally mix the mortar mixture and the um, stucco mixture ex to, to what is exactly on the walls. Wow. And then it has to be put on with the types of tools they would have used then, not the, necessarily the type of trowels we would use today. Yeah, sure. And they can't, like, they're not going to plaster or, or, or stucco over a bullet hole, yeah. for instance. Yeah. So it has to, it's, it's time consuming, it takes a tremendous amount of planning, and it takes a lot of financial support. <laughs> sure. So how, in, in the few minutes that we have left then, uh, I know people could go online and we've been showing the website mm -hmm. where they could go and get more information, mm -hmm. especially about the upcoming uh, kitchen conversations that you're having uh, right on through the fall, as mm -hmm. well as programs that you're going to have next mm -hmm. year. But I mean, if people want to uh, help you in your mission, uh, whether it's a, a donation or a volunteer mm -hmm. um, uh, that is interested in, in uh, spending some time there, um, you know, they could go through the website and they can mm -hmm. contact you that way if yep. they so want a desire to, uh, to help out in the mission. I mean, this is, you know, we talk about history. I mean, growing up, history was always something that was in the past. But today, learning about this past uh, is pretty much organic. It's still alive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could go to a building like Cliveden and you could go to the home and you could tour and see for yourself and, and you could, and, or you could read, uh, you know, about Benjamin Chu and you can, you know, maybe not scour through all those pages that were turned uh -huh. over to the, uh, the historical society. But uh, again, you know, history then is still so relevant and yeah. so pertinent today, just like it was you yeah. know, 200 years ago. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, you can go to our website, www.cliveden.org and, and, you know, find links and how to easily communicate with us. Um, but one of the things that we, we you said it that it's it's history is very alive today mm -hmm. and so uh like with our uh, cliveden conversations we have one coming up this friday uh, it is about the 1767 kitchen dependency it's with philip scott who's the architect with uh, ksk architects who is uh leading what's really now architectural archaeology mm. we're not building anything or repairing anything at this point we're identifying we're, we peeled away layers of walls, layers of floor to show, uh, you know, like part of the linoleum has come off. And mm -hmm. at one point, a bathroom was in front of where the hearth used to be and mm -hmm. things like that. And Dr. Emily Cooperman, who's an architectural historian um, and, and just historian to, to help us fill in what some of the some of the information that we can glean from the architectural sure. layers that are being revealed. And when people come to these events, they contribute their own family histories and their own current experiences of encountering a kitchen like that. So we've, we've brought in groups, community groups, groups from, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, senior living centers in Germantown, local churches have come, and people will say, oh, well, you know, I grew up down south and my family didn't even have a, a, a kitchen. We cooked over a fire. Mm -hmm. Or, so you get, it might be a little bit in the past, but it's still in the now tingling. It's part of people who are lives, people who are alive today. And, and also, um, even people coming in going, oh, 
this is to, to the 1959 kitchen. This is my dream kitchen. <laughs> and that's the kitchen, it's the type of kitchen they want to replicate in their home now. Yeah, yeah. Or recipes that uh, at the kitchen conversations, we, we have food, historical food, like we're going to be serving pepper pot mm -hmm. at the one coming up on Friday. And pepper pot is an old traditional Philadelphia dish. Mm -hmm. Not many people eat it nowadays because <laughs> right, right, right. it's tripe and not many people eat tripe nowadays mm -hmm. and um, or certain cultures don't eat tripe as sure. much as other cultures do now. So we're, we're going to have a version without tripe and maybe some with tripe for mm -hmm. the adventurous who can taste it. So it, it's, it's a, a sort of seamless sort of dynamic continuation of history is what I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, if you want to go and learn more information about all the programs uh, that are coming up at Cliveden, you could go online, and that is uh, cliveden.org. And uh, uh, look, there, if you want to volunteer, if you want to participate in one of the programs, it's all there. It's a great uh, uh, resource, and it will tell you the whole story uh, behind Cliveden, uh, from uh, the Chu family to the Battle of Germantown to what uh, the organization and what the property is involved in today. And I want to thank Brandy for being with us. Uh, this has been an eye-opening experience. Uh, needless to say, this story was not being told to me in my American history class way back when. So I want to thank you for coming and being well, on our program. Well, thank you, Paul. It's right. a delight to be here. Until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for spending this time with us here on The Philly Factor. My name is Paul Pirello. And until the next time, have a great day. And we just sit there and chit. <laughs>